Good evening and welcome to Upfront on the Joy News channel. Now, tonight, 66 years of unbridled boring, 17 IMF program. We ask a very simple question. Is Ghana able to manage its own debt crisis? I'll be joined by two professors who help me explore this issue. I'm Isaac Ophiaje. After this break, Upfront. Well, so Ghana has actually had 17 IMF programs. It looks as if the same results each time we go to the IMF. And on average, it just takes us three years and we are back uh, to the IMF negotiation table looking for a new program. And tonight, we ask a very simple question. Ghana has been begging for 66 years. Is there any alternative? Is it time to change the approach? Uh, joining me for this conversation, I'm fortunate to have two professors via Zoom. Uh, professor Lord Mensa is a professor of economics and then also finance lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. I also have Professor uh, Lord Malko Yevuga. He's an associate a professor of political economy and international relations at Gempa um, School of Public Service and Governance. Gentlemen, you're welcome to our front on the Joy News channel. Good evening and good evening to our viewers. Hi, right, Prof. Prof. Marco, are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I can hear you loud and clear. Good evening. Good evening. Well, let me start with you, Prof. Uh, Marco. 66 years of umbrella borrowing. And it looks as if any time we have this issue of um, economic crisis where external factors hit us so hard uh, that we cannot manage the crisis our own selves and we are back to the IMF negotiation table looking for bailout support. What is the next alternative? Well, the next, thank you very much, Isaac. And I should congratulate you for the documentary. Good job. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mm -hmm. Yes. So to your question, I think the fact that these external forces continue to hit us so bad, destabilizing the economy for us to even go to the IMF, is indicative of the fact that 66 years after independence, we haven't done a good job at building a very robust economy that can withstand such pressures. I mean, external pressures will happen, it will afflict every country, but the seriousness of the impact will depend on how robust your economy is locally. So that the fact that we continue to suffer from these external shocks uh, that much for us to go to the IMF actually underscores the fact that we haven't been doing our homework and we need to go back to the drawing board to look at what we can do as a nation to build up our economy in order to make it withstand such pressures coming from outside. Well, so, Professor Lord Mensah, whenever there's IMF in the picture, it's always that Ghana has heavily relied on uh, primary commodities and we should start adding value to our primary commodities. It looks as if it's... It's been the, the perfect team that has been sung every year, every time we go to the IMF. What is it? What, are, what is it that we are not doing right that we always have to go back to the IMF for the same, you know, uh, solutions or approach? Thank you very much. And then uh, let's um, go back to the documentary that was aired, I mean, the last time. Mm. You see, when Ghana is accumulating debt, there has always been reasons why we accumulate the debt. If you look at the post-independence, we're yearning for serious infrastructural development. And that is where we borrowed to an extent of building up, you know, hydro dams, building up roads and all those. And clearly, we're yearning for growth. The country needed infrastructure to meet up, you know, certain levels of, you know, growth or certain level of, you know, economic, I mean, dynamics. But then post independent after this, we went back into another debt problem. And subsequently to that, we had this, you know, um, what we call it, sub problem, structural adjustment, you know, program, which we implemented from um, 1983 all the way down to, I mean, lots of early part of 2000, and 2000, we got HIPIC, which, you know, they are all, they, they've, they've all been interventions of IMF and the World Bank to mm. rescue us from, 
you know, our debt. There has been, you know, reasons, dubious and genuine reasons for borrowing. I won't miss words. I won't miss words on that. Mm -hmm. Dubious and genuine reasons for borrowing. If you look at, you know, um, the genuine reasons for borrowing match up, you know, the assets that we have been creating over the years from our borrowing. You could clearly see that post independence, we're growing our infrastructure to a level where, you know, some of the infrastructure has less population in terms of their usage, mm. right? But then, if you look at from 2000, our era, let me put it that way, when we got exposed, you could see that the borrowings we have been doing does not match up with the infrastructural growth. If you look at, you know, borrowing is a debt, which is a liability we carry as a country on Absolutely, our yeah. public balance sheet. And we may have to look at the assets that we create from this, you know, liabilities. If the assets are not matching up with these liabilities, that is when we turn up to be susceptible to external shocks. And so we have a country where we've borrowed, we couldn't build up to a level where we can be resilient to shocks that we cannot control. That is our problem. Mm. So from where I sit, I think we have a lot to do because what is making the contemporary borrowing, I mean, the, after the 2000 and the most recent one has always been corruption and then economic mismanagement that has caused us to borrow more. Because if, if we want to get more dollars into the economy, we turn up to be lazy. I have a paper on that. You mm. can go online to check what is making typical African country like Ghana to borrow more instead of finding a way of diversifying their export. We have been using external borrowing to replace our you know, export drive, which can generate dollars for us. So the external borrowing, which has been the easiest way to get the dollars into the economy is what we have been relying on. So effectively, I can tell you that there's something we can do. We always have to match up you know, our borrowing with the assets that we are generating. If it is not matching up one to one, we better stop borrowing and right. start taking stock of what we're supposed to do. Right. So on the tangent of borrowing, you know, from the international capital markets, I remember somewhere in 2014, 2015, where Ghana had a graduation. And that graduation, uh, we moved from a lower, you know, income country to a middle income status, uh, which means that we had achieved the status where we couldn't borrow and repay over 40 years. And in simple terms, it's called the maturity stage. And in 20, 2007, we resumed you know, borrowing from the eurobond market. It looks as if, uh, per the data, we borrowed so much from the eurobond market. Is it an easy way of, of getting money uh, to fund you know, budgets and other expenditure? Right. Uh, is that my question or question to Dr. Uh, it's Professor your question. It's your question, Prof. Okay. So um, if you look at the what would make a country to borrow or let me say uh, someone to borrow we look at two things you are looking at the creditor and you know the composition of the creditor mm. we had opportunity to borrow from the world bank we had opportunity to borrow from you know other sources which probably may come with a lot of monitoring so if you take world bank's money and it's going into a project it is expected of you that even to the last block that will be laid, World Bank will be monitoring it with their country representative. Waiting now look for, at the Euro bond money. And yeah, so there's something, there's something we call moral hazard. Mm. After the money has come to you, what do you use it for? It's one of the problems that we need to look out for. That's why I mentioned that mismanagement and corruption has you know, made us grow appetite for the Euro bond market because it is an easy money. Yeah. When it comes, because the sources that provide that money you know, are different. As we speak now, with the debt restructuring that we are going to do, the, the, I believe that the one that would take the longest time is going to be the, the euro bond one because that has diverse, you know, creditors. And for them to come together, I mean, I think it would take some time. I know they form what we call creditor committee, but then for the creditor committee to ascertain the satisfaction of all those individual creditors, pensions, you know, financial institutions who have put money you know, on that market, I mean, will be quite, you know, tough. And mm. so it's going to be a problem. But we took advantage of how diverse that source is. And we kept on going there because anytime we go there and they are lending to us at a higher rate, 
we seem to be happy because we are bringing dollars to Ghana. So effectively, I would say that, you know, we just develop what we call, you know, Eurobond maniac, you know, when we say something, mm. you know, Eurobond maniac, where we thought, you know, it's an easy way of getting money, bringing the money, the control on it becomes a problem. It becomes easier when, it, you know, you are looking at the, the usage. So, I mean, as a borrower, you always want a soft side of borrowing. That is why sometimes we are tempted to take money from China. But mm. Chinese money is, is somehow of a cheaper cost. But even yeah. though the conditions that comes with it are quite sometimes tight to meet them, we always look at, you know, possible soft ways of bringing money to Ghana. And that is what has ended us this way. Right. So from where I sit, it's a matter of matching up your asset and your liabilities as a country. If your assets are not commensurating the liabilities that you're accumulating, you better stop borrowing. Right. Right, so Prof. Malko, uh, you know, the Eurobond market, if you look at the data, uh, borrowing there, the average interest rate is around 9.5, 8.5. That's the average. It's a range over there. Uh, do you think that if, if you are a finance minister, you, you look at this high interest rate and you compare it with that of the IMF, has the Eurobond, in spite of its high interest rate, become the easiest way that government, uh, you know, uses to get liquidity for support? Yes, yes, it is also so to build on the point that Professor Mensah made earlier. There's a, there's a reason for developing countries like Ghana who want to go to the euro bond market instead of going to the IMF and mm. the World Bank. The IMF and World Bank are multilateral institutions that have stringent rules, I mean, and conditions that come with the money to borrow from them. That's what they were set up. They were set up to regulate the international financial market or system in the 1940s. And if you look at the history of this appetite for borrowing from the private eurobond market and what have you, you go back to the 1970s. Because in the 1970s, in response to the OPEC high crisis, that most developing countries were going to the eurobond from the private European market to borrow money, bypassing the IMF or the EU system. And that led to the first debt crisis of the 1970s. And it looks like in the modern era, there are the same mistakes because most countries know that when look at what Ghana has to go through before we even got this great failure from the IMF. Look at all, I mean, if you are going to the private uh, money market, you don't have to go to that hazard. Prof, Prof Marco, so, we, 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 we are finding yes. difficulties in hearing you. Can you reposition yourself so we can hear you clearly? Uh, can you hear me now? Exactly, can you hear me now? absolutely. Clear. Uh, yeah, so the, the point I'm making is that so if you look at the IMA condition, even how we were able to secure the three billion, it tells you that it's not easy. I mean, going to the IMA and getting money as easy and cheaply as you would when you go to the Euro market. And that has been the historical uh, I mean, trajectory for most of the countries. Prof, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think we are still mm. encountering the same challenge. If you could mm. reposition yourself. Uh, but back to Professor Lord Mensa. IMF 17 times. And then you look at how much we borrow from the IMF. For the, for the 17th IMF program, the amount is around 3 billion US dollars. It comes with other you know, incentive from development partners like the World Bank. They will also be supervising their own program and be giving us other monies on the other side. But if you compare this huge money to what we've been getting uh, from almost all our 16 programs and you compare the two, it looks as if this is the biggest, and uh, what can we do with such money? Yeah, our economy has grown. And obviously, the scale that we find ourselves in, in terms of our GDP, in terms of our you know, population, in terms of our you know, balance of payment, clearly it tells you that, yes, if you are to look at the timing and then the uh, various indicators in ratio terms, mm. you realize that they're giving us almost the same thing. It's not, it's not, if you look at it in level terms, that is when you will say that, yes, indeed, uh, it, is, it, it, has, it has grown over the years. But in terms of ratio, relate that to our GDP, clearly you come to understand that what they've been giving us consistently has always been, you know, the same. But then let's look at, you know, the dynamics and how we accumulate assets. You see, um, the, the debt that we've been accumulating recently and the rate at which we accumulate asset with it. You know, earlier debt that we accumulated, if you look at the post-independent, the asset that we build up has certain kind of, 
you know, um, resilience, certain kind of um, um, a way of kind of projected. We still live on Akoshomo Dam, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we might borrowed for that purpose. And look at the population now and at the time. And that is exactly the kind of project we expect that our money, our debt can go into. Even if uh, money that we get from our debt can go into. If we are building an asset, right, and it turns out that the asset is projected to, you know, meet the population growth over the years, there's no way you cannot pay that debt. Absolutely. Now, out of corruption, we borrow, we tend to put it that, you know, money that we borrow into roads, into projects, and because of leakages out of corruption, we are not able to build assets that can stand a test of time. Look at the motorway. How many years now? We are yet to refurbish it and expand mm. it. That motorway has served generations. Those are the things we look out for when you build. If you go into the, the, the what do you call it, the developed world, they are not afraid of their debt because they have those type of assets that can yeah, service proper, proper generation. Asset and investment. That, yes, that can service the generation for years. The first permanent bond that was, you know, um, introduced in Europe or that was issued in Europe was the permanent bond to build, you know, the Euro, Euro tunnel. And the Euro tunnel, as you see goods and passengers, you know, moving on the rails, is people's money that is growing. So from where I sit, it's a kind of asset. And what we build with the monies that we generate from, you know, our debt issues. But, but Prof, how we done same if you look at... Uh, the circle, uh, Kwame Nkrumah circle interchange, the Pukwasi interchange. Exactly. Those are the assets we, we, I'm talking we, about. You borrowed money, you, you borrowed funds to, you know, um, establish those projects. Yes, you borrowed to establish those projects. If you look at the number of working hours savings that people have to do in crossing that Kwame Nkrumah interchange, looking at the circle bypass, looking at all those, you know, infrastructure, mm. that is what we need, you know, as, as a country. And there's no way having those, as, look at the airport as we speak now, Terminal 3. There's no way those assets cannot pay themselves. Mm. Even your creditors knows the quality of assets you've placed. So, so then it, it at simply means that... The, the, when, the, it comes to, the, when it comes to debt renegotiations mm. and they are matching up, you know, they're extending your number of years, they know that you have assets that can generate the cash flows to pay off the debt. So is it Even the case? So, 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 so let, let me bring in uh, Professor Maoko. So if you look at our international reserve, for instance, it's been dwindling. And any time we borrow money, it's, it's, it's just to you know, support the international reserve. It's not to uh, put them into projects that will, in the, in, in the long run, bring us um, you know, uh, funds or bring us revenue. So we tend to borrow to pay debt. Uh, has that been the case? That's likely been the case. And again, like I said earlier, I think it's our inability to grow the economy the way we should and be able to rely less on debt or borrowing. I mean, you need infrastructure, mm. but you need more the limit to which you can borrow to make it sustainable. You can't borrow the pain, I mean, for your debt. And for me, that is a, a challenge, the debt crisis that we have gone through to the extent that we have to go for hippie. If you are not careful, it's going to be a vicious sector. We keep going back to begging creditors to write off our debt. And that is not sustainable either. So I think that the country, we need to have a national conversation. Can there be a ceiling into how much we can mm. borrow? So government comes into power, they cannot just borrow anyhow. And like I was saying earlier, if you look at the enticement of the, of the private uh, money market from the 1970s to date, that has been easy money for countries to borrow. But you know, if you borrow, you have to pay. The reason we had to go to the IMF and the World Bank in 1983 was because of our time, we are not able to pay the debt that we borrow from the Euro and with the private market. So for most developing countries, that became a major challenge for development in the 1980s. And they have to now go back to the IMF. And that coincided with the political economic issues in the broader global economy. And like some of us have argued, you have an international economic system that is not favorable. To developing countries. This private euro bond market, they are part and parcel of the liberal international. Mm. I mean, it benefits certain countries a certain interest. And therefore, if you want to be smart about it, you need to be sure that you only borrow if you have to borrow 
smart girl we, we, we call it because otherwise you are going to accumulate more debt which you cannot pay and you going back to the same creditors i think that's where we find ourselves and i mean if you look at the, the international project economy asset you see the reason why even china when china was developing they didn't even want to join the wto they didn't yeah. want to be part of the liberal international order because they knew the limitations that we impose on them as a country. But we in Africa, we are normally the first to join these international bodies. I mean, recently the president was complaining about the, the ranking institutions and I mean, all the movies and others. And the, the argument is that once you insert yourself in the liberal international system, then all these measurements or rankings become the way we should adjust economically. Well, so well, we have to. We have to go back to the drawing board and see what we can do as a nation that will make us mm. less dependent. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good you brought in the, the African element, because I'm looking at uh, Kenya, for instance. They've been able to blend, you know, uh, borrowing from the World Bank, borrowing from the international capital markets, and then also doing very nice bilateral arrangements where they don't find themselves in just you know uh, borrowing from the commercial market so kenya has been able to uh, blend all the sources but it looks as if we have not been able to do that uh, we are just borrowing so much from the euro bond market which comes with so much interest with professor uh, lord mensa what's your take on this yeah i made um my you know submission earlier on this uh, which has to do with the moral hazard we want freedom of usage of the funds that comes from the borrowing. Mm -hmm. And if you want freedom of the funds that comes from the borrowing, you obviously go to the borrow uh, the euro bond market. If you talk about World Bank, clearly World Bank has, you know, agencies in country and, you know, regional agencies that will monitor projects that we do you do with their money. And so, you know, our economic managers who take decision on our behalf, are looking at possibility of borrowing from a, a source where when the money comes to them, they have the liberty to do anything with the money. That has been our problem. So effectively, Eurobond, I mean, who is coming from the uh, Eurobond market to come and tell you that or to monitor the money that you borrowed from them, the usage of it. So we've been borrowing over there to defray existing debt and then also, you know, put some of the money into the developmental project. But the kind of project that we put, you know, the money into are not determined clearly by the, mm. you know, by the debt contract. Yeah. And by so doing, we have the tendency of diverting it into other things. Yeah, so, so, prof, so for instance, I think in 2021, we became, you know, the world's trailblazer where we were the first country to issue a 0% trend euro bond. But here we are, we've been kicked out of that uh, market. Yeah, I mean, zero percent is all. If you let me put it that way, this way, if you are going to, you know, issue um, one bi one billion worth of bond, mm. and you are able to, you know, segregate the bonds into maybe the first four hundred million being, I mean, negotiate with the creditors, they give it to you at um, zero percent. The second three hundred million, they give it to you at three percent, mm. and then the next four hundred million, they give it to you at um 400 um 400 million they give it to you at um four um four percent mm. right are you not doing around seven percent if exactly. you have to issue it as a bullet seven, as a bullet one billion yeah you know they are all economic packages and repackaging we know how you know debt securities are packaged you can issue it as a bullet you know um i mean a debt where your creditors will buy into it or you can issue it in the form of tranches mm. and by so doing um, you, are, you are strategically trying to, I mean, beat down the interest service that you're supposed to do, you know, in a way, defer the interest payment, you know, to, uh, to, to, to latter years. So your first 400 million will be zero, and then three will be, um, the last 300 will be four, the subsequent one. Indirectly, on the average, if you look at the yield structure, you are paying the same interest as, you know, if you had to issue it bullet and pay 7%. So effectively, I would not say, uh, that is so novel. I mean, mm -hmm. to 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 come out yeah. and say we borrowed at zero percent. There are economic packages that you know can use to throw that's in the eyes of those who really don't understand you know bond issues. But in in this case, for instance, we 
uh, from 2000 to where we are currently. We went to uh, countries like uh, bilateral partners like China. And you know, those countries, they love to do business. We say we are tired of the grants and we do not want grants anymore. We wanted to do business. So between uh, 2000 and uh, 2019, we were able to rack up about $5 billion of loans from China alone. But here we are, we are trying to beg China to come to the negotiation table to take a haircut. Is it that there is something wrong with us in terms of, um, are we practicing fiscal populism in this case? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the borrowing that we did from China, they were to specific project. Now we may have to ask ourselves, do those projects have prospect? Mm. And would they be able to, if we are to restructure the debt, even to eight years, 10 years, would the project be able to generate enough cash flow to pay okay. back? Mm. Other than that, we can restructure and just defer our obligations to the latter years. The next government or whoever, you know, comes to take over will carry the burden. So effectively, we may we need to ask ourselves. That's why in my earlier submission, I, I, I said debt goes with what? Asset accumulation. Assets. What kind of assets have you been building up in your country in case China should come and say, okay, fine, we are going to give you that kind of moratorium in servicing your debt. I mean, how long can you, you know, go in terms of the asset that you have? If you borrow to build, you know, uh, what we call Kwame Nkrumah interchange, if you borrow to put up, you know, I mean, certain structures in mm -hmm. the country, would the asset be able to generate revenue, you know, to pay for, you know, the, the kind of debt you owe China? Those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. There is something wrong with us. And what is wrong with us is corruption and leakages of, you know, infrastructure and uncompleted, of, um, uncompleted infrastructure spreading mm -hmm. out across the country. Go around the country and start taking stock of, you know, uncompleted structures. All those things are loans. They are assets that are getting rotten, which we need more money to even convert them back to usage so that we can pay back the debt that goes with it. So for me, there's something wrong with us. We live in a country where, you know, a particular government will start a project. Another government will come, they will not continue. They have to start a new line of project altogether through borrowing. Not that it's, you know, money generated mm. in-house or it's, it's an IGF from Ghana. It's monies that we are going to borrow to come and start new projects. And sometimes I wonder the, kind, the lenders we have, whether they have the know-how of the kind of economy that we are running, where, you know, countries, Ghana borrows, you know, and then at the end of the day, assets that are being, you know, uh, put up by one particular regime, another government come, it won't even touch the asset at all, mm -hmm. leave and move on to another set of assets, which sometimes, you know, will cause for leakage. And let me tell you, in, in, this some, in some case, we have to me, even me, demolish me, and me, restart the whole project. Let me start. Let me tell you one thing. You see, in this country, you see economic managers, you see institutions, you will see um, those managing institutions yearning for, you know, I mean, project. Why are they yearning for project? Because huge sums of monies are involved. And the possible cuts that they will get also goes, you know, in a, in a way. That, uh, that will satisfy their generations. So effectively, um, they, 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 they don't look at the kind of projects that are being put up and the so, possible- So, so are, you say, are you saying we are borrowing for our own pockets or not for projects? Yes, indirectly, that is what it means. Let me come clear. Indirectly, that's what it means. Every institution wants to put up infrastructure that we, we're not saying that we don't need growth. Population mm. is growth. We need infrastructure. But we should know the kind of infrastructure we put up. You will see some infrastructures getting rotten, whilst new ones are being started with borrowed funds. Then you ask yourself, you know, what kind of economy are we managing? So effectively, those are our problems. And we need a government that will go around taking stock of all uncompleted projects and say, for me, I'm not going to start a new one until we, we, we finish, you know, the, the, the ones that are getting rotten, put them in active way. And of course, let me tell you one thing, you see, we are also fond of, you know, getting a structure completed and then thinking that structure is a complete project. No. When you take a project, you know, when you go into project management, we have, we have structural completion, which normally 
our economic managers goes to you know commission them but then the question is is the project operationally complete complete do we have the project working we need to also ask yourself ourselves is the project financially complete if it is financially complete then it means the project can pay for itself and then we go for that to say the project must be economically complete mm. that means that project has paid for itself and it is spilling over into the economy positively we don't just you know commission project for commission sake and i've seen politicians quoting monies they put in project which you know sometimes we don't even realize the project we are borrowing to satisfy to put money in our pocket mm. we're not borrowing to develop right. the country right professor Malko Yevuga, after this break, I'll ask you that same question. Is it that we lack the political will to borrow and then use them, uh, you know, to bring up that infrastructure that we need? So after this break, Upfront continues. Welcome to Upfront with me, Isaac Kofi J. Uh, before the break, I was asking... Uh, uh, Professor Maoko Yevuga, if he thinks uh, that Ghana, our economic problem has been just a case of uh, mismanagement or lack of the political will to do the right thing. Prof, if you can still hear me, I want to know your take. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. I think I want to make this point before mm. we I even answer your question. Mm. You know, when we were talking earlier about the international commercial market, and the tendency for countries to want to go there for borrowing. I think the point we need to also remember is, I mean, these international markets, they exist for a purpose, and you cannot take away the colonial, new colonial legacies of the international financial system. Absolutely. And if you look at the unequal relation, you have to ask, you have to ask the question, who benefits? And if African countries keep going to those markets, they don't have to go there so they can sustain the liberal financial systems. And you also look at the outflow of money from Africa to these uh, European countries, which they intend to put in their banking systems and we go to borrow them. So we need to, so, so that takes me back to the, the, your question about the political will. So, so probably before, we, we before, lack... before that, are you saying that those markets are set up, you know, against us? Yeah, in many ways. You know, in the 1970s, all the developing countries were actually calling for a new international order mm. because they realized that the international system was literally set up to, 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 to favor the Western powers or the Western countries. So there was a, a whole lot of discussion about a new international order, how to include reforms to the existing financial system or mm. structures. But that never happened. So you, you, you can't run away from the fact that, by and large, we are disadvantaged. And this started from the colonial period when we were integrated into the global economy. We are given specific functions or rules to play in the global economy. And that has not changed. So that we is, need that, that, is, that is to produce raw materials or primary commodities. Exactly. Exactly. And in your documentary, you, you actually showed how colonialism coincided with the Industrial Revolution. Mm. And that history had continued. Today, most commercial money markets are targeting only poor countries. Yeah. They are countries to make money for the developed world. Hello, hello Prof. I mean, Prof. Maoko. If you can reposition yourself uh, so you can make your point. Prof, can you hear me? Of business, yes. Well, it's unfortunate, Prof. Marcos line is not favoring us. But, uh, Professor Lord Mensa, do you have anything to say on this? Hi, Prof. Prof. Lord Mensa, can you amuse? Do you think that the, the entire global economic system uh, is established uh, to give us that unfavorable, um, you know, put us in that unfavorable position? Just like Prof. Yeah, Marco was trying I, to communicate. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. You know, even though we are part of the, you know, the global network, I think we have our own specific rules and regulations. We are a sovereign, you know, country. We determine when and how 
we should borrow. Mm. We determine what to send out there. We determine how we can, you know, create value. But, 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 but Prof, how, how do you determine economic sovereignty when almost everything that goes on in your economy is dollarized? Yeah, of course, we have, you know, managed the economy to get to that level. Mm. At a point where we had some governments telling Ghanaians that grow what you eat, right? We've mm. had that slogan before, isn't it? Yeah. Did we vote for that government? Voted it out. We live in a country mm. where we even vote for people because they can speak English, you know. So effectively, we have managed the economy to this level. And I think it's about time, you know, we localize most of these things. So, Prof, stay with me. I, I would want to still go back to... I may uh, have to leave for church. I mean... All right. Me. All right. Okay. If, if so, you can continue. Right. So, I'm... I'm, I'm yeah. So effectively, we have we have managed the economy to this level mm. where um, we've dollarized everything, and we're looking at a possibility of um, localizing some of the economic activities. And I always say that if we are able to, you know, produce fifty percent of, I mean, food that we consume, right, we should be able to control, you know, the dollar demand in yeah. our country. You know, Ivory Coast upon all the COVID and all those, you know, um, Ukraine war and all those, they're still recording inflation below 20%. Yeah. And we ask ourselves, why were they able to manage? Because the essentials, they're able to produce them in-house. We're talking about food. And so if we leave ourselves and we turn out to be, I mean, importing everything, and we live in a country where the, the importers and then you know, exporters have more or less found them their, their, their way into, you know, politics, it will be difficult to dig out, you know, the dollarization. But I can tell you that a time will come that we'll get there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lord Mensah. And Professor Lord Marco, do you think that we can actually maneuver our way through this? Uh, you were trying to say that uh, the whole global system does not favor uh, you know, the African. Uh, do you still think that we can maneuver our way through it? Yes. Yes. Prof, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes, I can hear you. Exactly. All right. You can continue and make your point. Yes, the point I'm making is that I can make a good point. I don't know. I can make a good point. And then we're still talking on the, we're still talking about Ghana's over 66 years of umbrella boring. And Prof, if you can hear me, uh, you can go ahead and make your point. Yes, I can hear you. I, I hope you can hear me too. Exactly. Yeah, so the point I'm making is that yes, we 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 still can manage our economy, but the point I made earlier, which um Professor Lodensa disagreed, is that you can't take away the, the impact of the in broader international economy yeah. from the equation. We need to factor that into the analysis. Yes, as a country, we are sovereign. We, we have the right to do whatever we want to do in terms of borrowing. But you are operating in an international system that is so interconnected. Therefore, you need to take that into consideration. I would say that one of the things we need to do as a country is to begin to restructure the base of our economy. You can't continue to have the same economic base that relies heavily on the, on the import uh, of almost everything and export of primary product. That is not sustainable. So we need to restructure the economic system that we have to make sure that we are good, a more sustainable uh, local economy. If you take the economic system we have now, it's not different from what we had uh, at the time of independence. And I think that is part of the problem. And in terms of mismanagement and corruption, I think much has been said about that. We need to track and be sure, do we use the monies that we borrow for? Do we use them for um, as a capital goods, like roads and things that will add value to our economy? Or we just use them for um, consumption. If you are borrowing and spending on consumption, then you are not going to be able to make any mm. because the borrowing will translate into infrastructure. 
into economic, building the economic base. So right now, I think that it depends so much on borrowed money to pay salaries, to, to service a debt, and to pay our political uh, elite. This is not sustainable, and I think we need to go back to the Trembo as a country to have that conversation about, like I said earlier, there should be limits about how much a government can to borrow, borrow, and that way we can be able to control. But if a government takes a electoral victory as a license to keep borrowing, then that in itself is problematic. So I think though where we are not overwhelmed by that. Anyway. Mm. Right, Prof. So, so let's let's look at Ghana's fiscal position currently. Uh, we are hoping to generate some 160 uh, mil a billion Ghana cities and spend close to 200 billion Ghana cities, uh, leaving a huge fiscal deficit. Now, if you look at the expenditure, for instance, there's this huge line item in there. There are actually two: uh, compensation of employees and then also payments on interest. For instance, payments on interest on our loans or debt servicing is almost, uh, almost uh, six, six, uh, 60 billion Ghana cities. And you look at a small country like Ghana generating about 160 billion Ghana cities and spending close to 60 billion on interest payments. Do we really have a way out of this situation? Well, there are certain things that are within our control. So let's look at those ones first. Mm. One of those things is the compensation that you talk about. I think over time, in this world, successive governments have overthrown the bureaucratic state. The bureaucratic and administrative state of Ghana has grown to the extent that every government appoints any number of not only ministers, I'm not even mm. ministers, but you look at the, the, the other appointees, political appointees. You look at take the director, I mean the directors of various state-owned enterprises. Now we have the director, or we have the CEO, we have two deputies. In the ministries, we have ministers, we have many deputies. And they are adding, they are recruiting. There's no limit to recruitment to the public sector. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I think Prof's line has been very terrible today, uh, but we are still on upfront on a Joy News channel. We are talking about Ghana's over 60 years of unbridled borrowing, uh, where we always go, go back to the IMF, um, you know, for programs. This is our 17th, and we're asking a very simple question. This is our 17th program. Are we expecting an 18th and 19th? Is it going to be infinite? Uh, a prof will join me via phone for the conversation. But if you look at Ghana's books, our debt levels are not really looking good, uh, where we are approaching almost a trillion Ghana cities. Trillion Ghana cities, and the, the debt to GDP ratio is also approaching 80%. Such a small country, and uh, you look at all of the our economic indicators. For instance, today, uh, the inflation figures have been released, and there's a slight marginal increase from the 41.2% we recorded in April uh, this year to 42.2%. I have been looking at the data and I'm looking at the month on month, uh, for instance, it's been on an upward trajectory. And so I wasn't so surprised when we saw inflation hitting 42.2%. Uh, prof, it looks as if, you know, the smallest shock affects us a lot. So for instance, inflation, we were happy when we, we saw the, the continuous fall from the 54.1% peak in December uh, to 40. But currently, there's a marginal increase. Is there any structural, uh, you know, reasons behind some of these things? Yes. As I said at the beginning of the program, my argument is that, is that if we don't have a robust economy, if we don't have an economy that can withstand, that is resilient enough, the any shock coming from outside is going to destabilize mm. the economy base. And we, we saw that when COVID happened and later Russia, Ukraine happened. I mean, the, the argument is that as for these external shocks, they will continue to happen. And if you look at the way countries have been impacted, we are all not impacted the same way. So the impact is dependent on the, 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 the nature of your economy. We don't have a, resi a resilient economy that is able to withstand 
some of these external shocks. So we have to begin to see how we can build our economy and make it less dependent on external forces. If you are going to be importing almost everything from outside, anytime there are shocks in the, in the broader global economy, then you are going to have problems. And that is what happened when COVID happened and when Russia and Ukraine happened. So we need, and we saw how government was struggling to even control import of certain commodities in order to stabilize mm. the city or the local currency. That is, is, uh, is an indication that overall we haven't done massive independence to build an, an economy that is less dependent. We need to, the structure of the economy needs to change so that at the end of the day, even though we are still part of the broader international system, we are not so dependent so right. that we, we are able to rely on ourselves in attaining some of mm. the basic things that we need uh, as a country rather than rely on other countries. Because when that happens, we are always going to be at the mercy of these countries and the, the, the shocks in the international system. Right. So if you look at the IMF program, for instance, usually the first three indicators that the program is supposed to help us tackle is inflation. This is uh, yeah. depreciation of the or exchange rate. And then we go ahead with other indicators. Uh, in the IMF program, the IMF is uh, telling us that we should desist uh, from restricting imports of goods. But if you look at our import cover, for instance, it's, it's, it's nowhere, it's nothing good to write home about. And our external reserve is also very low. But, Doc, if you look at the inflation figures, for instance, some of the top 20 drivers, uh, I look at some of them, and most of them are import goods. So is it the case that we are allowing what is happening ex elsewhere to affect our economy indirectly. Yeah, exactly. That's what we are doing. And that is back to the point that I was disagreeing with uh, Professor Lord Mensa. You see, if you say you are sovereign and you have control over your economy, mm. then why should the IMF be telling you not to restrict imports? The fact that they can even tell us that it shows that we, we are not sovereign, economically sovereign after all. And that is one of the challenges of going to the IMF. You see, once you go to the IMF, then the, the conditionalities that will come will actually hurt you. Because, you see, and, and it's not for nothing that the international financial system was created as part of the liberal international order. And we are members of the WTO. And as for the WTO regulations, there, there are limits to what we can do in terms of um, controlling imports and all that. We need to play within the rules of WTO. And I don't think it's going to be that easy for us to say we are going to limit uh, import just because we are sovereign countries. We are part of these international bodies, and there are clear guidelines and regulations that govern the way they manage the international economy. And once we are in the IMS program, then it means that some of these things that we could have done by ourselves as a sovereign nation, we can no longer do these things because the policies, just like such adjustment period, when you are told to privatize state-owned enterprises, when you are told to remove subsidies, when you are told to downsize the public sector. Similar things are going to happen because the IMF and the World Bank, they are liberal institutions, and they want to make sure that every country that does business with them is going to go according to some of these conditions that they set for them. Right. So the problem is very simple. It's, 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 it's currently, you know, partitioned into two. It's either you tackle... Uh, the revenue aspect or you tackle the expenditure aspect. If you look at the revenue aspects, we've introduced so many things, we've revised so many of the, the taxes. Do you think that uh, businesses or the ordinary Ghanaian is being overburdened with taxes? Well, yeah, definitely. And you've heard the, the, the business sector people complaining about the tax, the so many taxes that have been introduced lately. And the average Ghanaian, because now the utility... Um, regulators have also increased their tariffs. And that's going to be hitting people. I mean, because income levels have not changed drastically. And for me, that's, I mean, so you have the revenue uh, envelope and you also have the expenditure envelope. I mean, in as much as we are asking for the, the average Ghanaian or industry to pay a little bit more in terms of taxes, we must also be asking government to also cut down pa pa some of these expenditure. At the height of COVID and other financial crisis, the president gave directives about moratorium on imports of new cars mm. and even foreign travel. We, we don't hear much of that anymore. Does it mean that we are going back to the same ways of, I mean, buying cars and 
uh, foreign travels for all government officials. So the, the Ghanaian people could only tighten their belts and make sacrifices if they see their leaders in insane. It looks as though right now the average Ghanaian is being asked to do so much more to carry much of the burden. Right. But the political elite don't seem to be doing the same. And right. like I said earlier, we need to actually have a feeling on how much recruitment that can happen in the public sector if government comes into power. Because it looks like now governments are coming to power and they are just recruiting, adding that to the, to the, the public bill right. or the, the wage bill. That is not sustainable. You can't have a country where we don't even know, for example, now, how much people do we have on the Supreme Court. We no. don't even know no. how many people we have in the public sector. I mean, there should be a limit about how much okay. governments are able to appoint yeah. if we are going to be asking the average Ghanaian to keep uh, taking on additional tasks in order to rake in more revenue. Then the government that we have voted for should be seen to be listening to the people by cutting down unnecessary expenditure. Right, Prof, final comments. Do you see us begging, or you think that the 17th IMF program will put an end to this whole begging spree? Well, as for the begging, so long as we continue to do the old things, you see, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and be expecting uh, better or different results. If you don't do what is right, if you continue the trajectory of overborrowing, of mismanagement, of corruption, then we we'll keep going back because any time we, we, we overborrow, we mismanage the economy and there's so much corruption, then things go out, out of gear. Right. Then we go to the World Bank and the IMF. So I think that the question, the, or the answer to the question is dependent on our behavior. If we are going to be disciplined okay. and going to cut our coat according to our cloth or to our size, then we can, we can avoid future um, mm. visitations to the IMF. But okay. if you continue on the trajectory of overborrowing and uh, uh, corruption and mismanagement and overgrowth of the right. public uh, sector, right. then I don't see us not going back to the IMF in, in the future. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Lord Mauko Yevuga. He's an associate professor of yep, political you know. economy and international relations at Gimpa Governor's School of Public Service and Governors. I was joined by, you know, Professor Lord Mensa. He's an economist finance lecturer at the University of Ghana. Folks, this is where time will allow us to peg our conversation. Join News Prime is at next.